Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for the, the latest edition of Coffee and Council. And uh, once again, thrilled to be joined by uh, our partners uh, in the Hilton Head market and other markets of the Burr Forum and Law Firm. And we just are so thankful for, uh, for their continued partnership in this particular webinar that is targeted directly at what is our primary economic driver, and that is hospitality and tourism. Uh, we're so thankful that Burr Forman continues to, uh, to promote and, and, and give free of charge this quality programming uh, to our local businesses, to our small businesses uh, that, that need it most. And uh, goodness knows, um, I, I don't want to play a, a pun on this, but um, for restaurants and, and theaters and arts groups and, again, members of our tourism and hospitality community, your plate is full right now. There is a lot going on, uh, but perhaps some things that uh, you could continue to need to think about when it comes to um, uh, legal issues in your business. Uh, you're going to just get a, a great uh, a great rundown of information that, again, these attorneys are dealing with all day, every day, and uh, are the experts on uh, what potentially you are facing or could face in the near future. So uh, put your thinking caps on. Again, the Hilton Head Island Bluffton Chamber of Commerce is thrilled to bring you uh, yet again another great morning of quality information. And uh, Melissa, again, thank you to your team, uh, you and Scott, Corky, uh, John Carroll. Um, we're so thankful that uh, that you're with us on Hilton Head and can provide uh, this expert analysis and, and insight on legal issues. Thanks, Hannah. We certainly appreciate it. Good morning to everybody. And thank you to you and Bill Miles and the Hilton Head Bluffton Chamber team. We at Burr Forman do appreciate the opportunity to partner on these events. And we look forward today to bringing some valuable legal information to those in the hospitality sector. We started this series this year, um, our coffee and council series, and you know, we were hoping to have some coffee with you in person, and unfortunately due to COVID, we've uh, been in this virtual mode, but the goal as we continue forward um, later this year will be to get back to some in-person events. We had um, an event in February that we kicked this series off with, which was a labor and employment um, update. We then had a couple of speakers on PPP loans and loan forgiveness and tax issues in March. Um, those can be found on our website at burr.com if you miss those and have any interest in those. But today, we're going to be focusing on legal issues in the hospitality sector. And, you know, my name is Melissa Azalian Kenny. I'm a partner on the labor and employment team. I also lead the firm's immigration practice. And I'm going to start us off today on some labor and employment issues, but I am very happy to be joined by three of my Burn Foreman colleagues um, who do have experience working in the hospitality sector. And they're going to be speaking with you for about 20 or 25 minutes today. If you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to use the chat box on the right hand side or most of the speakers. I think all of the speakers have their email addresses on their presentations and you certainly can email any of us with anything that you might have. But let me introduce these uh, partners to you. First, I have Corky Klett. Corky's a partner on our intellectual property team in our Charleston and Columbia offices. And Corky has a broad and diverse IP practice throughout the Southeast practicing in courts across the United States. He specializes in patents, trademarks, and copyrights, and today he's going to talk to us about those things and how they relate to the hospitality sector. Next, we have Scott Thomas. Scott is a partner in our corporate and commercial litigation team. He's out of the Jacksonville, Florida office. Scott represents large hotel chains on complex litigation matters. He also has significant trial experience. And he's going to give us an update today on liability issues. And specifically, he's going to cover the South Carolina COVID-19 Liability Immunity Act, which many of you may have been following. And last but not least, we have John Carroll. John's an attorney on our real estate team in the Hilton Head office. And he also has a practice developed in alcohol licensing where he helps clients navigate hospitality and food and beverage regulations. We like to think of him as our resident beverage lawyer. So today, John will be sharing some information with you about alcohol beverage licensing and related issues. So with that, I will um, share my screen, get us started today on um, some labor and employment issues that might be on the minds of many employers. Hopefully everybody can see my screen there in a moment. Okay, so, um, I want to just cover a couple of things. Uh, first, about COVID-19 vaccines and testing. I know we're getting a lot of questions on that um, and, you know, what employers should and shouldn't do and what they can require and, and mandate versus what has to be voluntary. We are also going to give a quick update on the mask mandates and cover South Carolina 
Senate Bill 177, which relates really to protections for those perhaps who don't want to get a vaccine. I'm then going to um, provide you a little bit of information about the American Rescue Plan update. This was the March 2021 very comprehensive um, legislation that passed at the federal level. It included many of those economic impact payments that people receive, child tax credits, but it also included some things that are relevant to employers relating to COBRA, unemployment, some paid leave provisions and tax credits. And then I just have a few tips at the end on return to work and leave considerations. So let's start first with vaccines. And the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, came out with some guidance um, in 2020, and it's just been repeatedly updated. They have a, a technical assistance sort of document with a, a Q&A format. It's a very helpful resource if you haven't seen it. But a couple of things that I want to highlight here are from that guidance and do address the idea of vaccinations and testing. The first is vaccinations. Can an employer require employees to get vaccinated? And then can an employer require proof of vaccination? And what the answer here is generally yes. And, and what that drives uh, from is that a vaccination or proof of a vaccination is not deemed a medical exam or a medical inquiry. If they were, there are some rules that, you know, might make it a little more difficult for an employer to require vaccination or require proof, because when something is a medical test, you have to show that it's job related and consistent with business necessity. But because it's not deemed that here, um, employers can do this. Now, many employers are asking, should I do that? You know, what are the pros? What are the cons? What do I do if an employee refuses to get a vaccine? Or perhaps are there other alternatives that I can utilize? Can I, um, you know, provide educational programs and, and tell people about the benefits of vaccination? Or rather than requiring it, should I just provide paid leave? You know, if an employee voluntarily wants to get a vaccination. So that is really up to you, you know, as a business, but just know that you can do that if you would like. Now, some, not many, but I would say some employers are considering whether they should um, go ahead and, and actually provide the vaccine on site. Maybe it's an employer sponsored issue. What I want to point out here is that you have to be careful. Pre-screening vaccine questions can be improper disability inquiries under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that is going to apply to probably most of the people on the call today. That's you have 15 or more employees, the ADA applies to you. So what we recommend are some strategies to kind of avoid getting into ADA concerns, and that would be administer the vaccines on a voluntary basis or, you know, certainly require proof of the vaccine from a third party provider that doesn't have a contract with the employer. So rather than you um, conducting the vaccin vaccination on site, you might voluntarily encourage your employees to do it and have them do that at a third party and then request proof of the vaccine. Now, there are times when employees may say that they can't get a vaccination for various reasons. One of those might be religious reasons. So if they claim that, you know, due to a sincerely held religious belief, they're not able to get the vaccination, the law would say that you have to offer some sort of accommodation as an employer under Title VII. So you couldn't, you know, mandate the vaccine in that case, and you would want to have a conversation with them about what accommodations could be offered. Um, you know, religion is defined very broadly here. We're not really talking necessarily just about church membership or even a belief in God. Something like a moral belief against putting chemicals in your body can be deemed a religion. So keep in mind the third bullet point here. If somebody requests a religious accommodation and you do have an objective basis for questioning it, you can request supporting documentation, but very, you know, I'd say tread lightly here. Um, this is an area where um, sometimes employers can ask too many questions and claim that maybe somebody doesn't have a sincerely held religious belief and then run afoul of, of Title VII. The same sort of accommodation rules apply in the disability context. So there may be somebody that comes forward and says, you know, I know, employer, you're requiring the vaccine, but I can't get it. I have um, a disability that prevents me from getting the vaccine. So, you know, with... <laughs> someone who claims a disability, 
you can request medical documentation from them. And you want to have this interactive exchange, you know, asking them questions and trying to understand what they're saying. But, you know, if you're requiring a, a vaccination because it's some sort of safety-based qualification, and you can show that if somebody wasn't vaccinated, they would be a direct threat to the health or safety of themselves or others, then, you know, that is something that you can take into consideration. But the, the ADA would always say, try to find a reasonable accommodation. Um, this slide talks about some things that you might evaluate, you know, if they don't get vaccinated, what would be the, the length of the risk? What would be the severity of the harm? Um, how imminent is the harm? You know, you think about an environment like a healthcare setting, a nursing home, a hospital. These might be areas where that would be very difficult to accommodate. Um, maybe not so in other sectors, like hospitality, for example, where you may be serving patrons or guests who aren't vaccinated. So it's it's a case by case analysis, but remember that you you can't exclude them from the workplace if there is some reasonable accommodation that exists or if they would not be a direct threat. We're still getting a lot of questions about testing as well, and I just wanted to cover very quickly here the rules um, based on the EEOC guidance. Uh, COVID viral tests are permissible under the ADA. Remember though that an antibody test is different. And that is deemed, um, you know, that's really determining if somebody, um, you know, had the antibodies and that's deemed to be a medical exam. So it has to be job related and consistent with business necessity. So you need to be very careful about um, understanding that and, and where the viral test is permissible, the antibody test generally is not to permit somebody to enter the workforce. You can still conduct temperature checks. I know um, some employers are still continuing to, to do that, particularly in the medical sector, but, but others as well. And, you know, you, you can require testing. You can require temperature checks. What you don't want to do is sort of pick and choose who you do that with. So you don't want to do that for some employees and not others. It kind of goes back to that whole, um, um, you know, sort of consistency and, and not um, treating, treating people differently. But if you have a basis for believing based on objective evidence that somebody has COVID, maybe they're exhibiting symptoms or they've been in close contact with somebody who tests positive, then you can treat them differently based on those symptoms that they're experiencing. What about asking employees if their family members have COVID-19 or COVID-19 symptoms? The EEOC guidance there talks about the GINA Act, which is the Genetic, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And what that uh, law says is that you can't ask medical questions about family members. The workaround there is you can say, have you been in cl close contact with anybody who's been diagnosed with COVID-19 or who has symptoms? And if the answer is yes, <coughs> then you may have a legitimate basis to ask them to quarantine for a period of time. All right, let's just talk quickly about the mask mandate. And, and I wanted to bring this up because we are getting some questions from clients about whether they can still require masks in the private sector. So this slide talks about, at least locally here in the Hilton Head Bluffton area, what we've seen. And, you know, we know that the town of Bluffton and Beaufort County um, have released their mask ordinance. It expired on April 15th. Um, ending mask requirements in public spaces. The city of Beaufort's ordinance will end tomorrow and Hilton Head is scheduled to end on May 16th unless it's extended by town council. But remember that these deal with public spaces and they just say that the mask is not required. If you as a private business want to require your clients or your guests or your employees to continue to wear masks, that is certainly possible to do. So that's an individual choice that you will have to decide what is appropriate for your business. And last but not least on this topic, I want to talk about this COVID-19 vaccination bill that's in this, um, it, it's actually passed the Senate, but it um, is now being debated in the House before a particular committee. And the focus here is really more on protecting those who choose not to get a vaccine. So what it says is that vaccinations are voluntary, that an employer cannot take adverse action like, like a demotion or a termination or a suspension against someone who doesn't undergo a vaccination, and that you can't require isolation or quarantine if somebody chooses not to go 
through the vaccination process. Now, certainly if they have symptoms, they've tested positive, something like that, you, you would have fl some flexibility there. But just by virtue of saying, you haven't been vaccinated, therefore you must isolate or quarantine, this bill would say, no can do. There is an exception for those organizations that are treating or caring for vulnerable populations. I've listed that here on the slide. And, you know, this is going to be your nursing homes, your hospital, something like that, but probably not hospitality. Now, the bill does not uh, prevent, you know, encouraging, promoting, or administering vaccin vaccinations. And it even says that an employer can offer incentives to employees who elect to be vaccinated. You know, we had a question from an, a client this week on that. And I, think, I do think you have to be careful about incentivizing monetarily or otherwise vaccinations because you could get into some disparate treatment arguments with people about, well, you know, why did you offer it to this person but not this person? So I do think you have to be careful about offering incentives for vaccinations. Um, it also does say that you, as an employer, can still mandate quarantines or isolations if somebody's diagnosed with COVID or has symptoms, close contact, those sorts of things. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how this um, bill unfolds. Like I said, it passed the House, passed the Senate currently in the House. It is being followed by the chambers across the state, and um, we'll have to see how it unfolds. All right, on quickly to the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, and, and I know these slides have a lot of information, but this is really recent stuff, and I thought it was helpful and, and, and valuable to make sure that you were aware of it. And the first thing that I want to mention here relates to COBRA benefits. And COBRA, for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with it, is the health care continuation coverage. So when you have a group health plan and somebody terminates or they reduce hours and they then would go off the group health plan, you have to offer them COBRA coverage if you have 20 or more employees for a certain period of time. And usually the premium cost is paid by the employee. It's about 102 percent. I think it can be up to 102 percent of the health insurance premium cost. So it's it's quite expensive. Well, the American Rescue Plan has now indicated that employers must offer free COBRA health premiums between April 1st and, April, and September 30th for those that have lost coverage. Um, and they, they base that on this term assistance eligible individuals. And I've kind of listed the, the categories that can apply there. So if you were enrolled, if you had an employee enrolled in COBRA on or after April 1st because they reduced hours or they were terminated, then they wouldn't be entitled to this free COBRA coverage. Um, and that could last, you know, for the full 18 month of COBRA um, eligibility. If they get on another group health plan or have another reason to terminate coverage, of course, it, it ends at that point. The assistance eligible individuals also applies to um, somebody who maybe previously elected COBRA, well, previously could have elected COBRA but declined coverage, or they were on COBRA and then they discontinued, maybe because it was so expensive. And if they would have had COBRA existing past April 1st, they may also qualify for these free COBRA payments. Now, this doesn't apply if somebody terminates voluntarily, although that's not defined in the rules. It also doesn't apply if somebody's terminated based on gross misconduct. But the key here for you as an employer is knowing that you may have to offer free COBRA coverage, but also that you can get an employer tax credit against your Medicare taxes. And one point that I want to make here is know who gets the tax credit. You know, if you are a fully insured plan, you're going to continue to pay premiums to your carrier, but your carrier gets the credit, not you. If you're fully or partially self-insured, you would get the credit. So just make sure that you're aware of this. A lot of times in settlement agreements, we do negotiate COBRA payments that we pay as consideration for the release of an agreement, but this kind of makes that interesting as well. So, um, be aware of the, the new COBRA rules. Let me jump quickly to the paid leave under the American Rescue Plan. And, you know, some of you may be able to think back to the days of the FFCRA, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. It wasn't that long ago, right? <laughs> and it ended on December 31st, 2020. That law required employers to provide paid leave to employees if the employer had less than 500 employees. So 
a lot of businesses had to do this. That expired December 31st, um, 2020. Actually, my slide there, I said 2021, but it, it expired on December 31st, 2020. And what we have now is still a voluntary program. So effective April 1st, an employer can get paid leave, paid sick and FMLA leave credits if they voluntarily provide the leave through September 30th. And I've broken that down into EPSL, which is this paid sick leave. An employer can get up to 10 days or 80 hours for credits for leave that they pay. That would be something like um, maybe somebody's experiencing COVID symptoms, they're seeking a diagnosis, um, they're getting a vaccine, they're recovering from the vaccine. Those have been added to that list. And so you can get some tax credits for payments that you make to employees voluntarily. The other piece is this EFMLA. That's limited to 12 weeks of EFMLA. Um, it's a $12,000 aggregate tax credit that you can get. But the key here is they've expanded EFMLA reasons. So you might recall that it was really just child care closures or school closures before. Now it's expanded to the reasons that are covered under the EPSL. So it's also for the COVID vaccine, recovery from the vaccine. So lots of opportunities here for employers that voluntarily want to offer this paid leave and at the same time get tax credit, but not required like it was under the FFCRA. So last thing that I want to say here just to wrap up is um, a couple of return to work and leave considerations. Know your handbook. And if you don't have a handbook, think about getting one. You want to assess your PTO policies and your other policies on paid and unpaid leave right now and modify those if it's necessary. You know, you can see a lot of these federal uh, mandates and laws are kind of around that area. So I think a lot of employees are sometimes confused. What does my employer pay for and what don't they? So have a clear policy that will allow you to be consistent um, on your enforcement and clarity. <coughs> Stick to the policy. Try not to deviate as a general rule and make sure that you document, you know, what you've done. Also, remember to evaluate your leave request uh, for COVID or medical reasons under relevant handbook policies and laws. Don't forget about the ADA, the FMLA, Title VII. OSHA is really starting to move into a, a real space here. They have some guidelines that they've come out with. So even if you don't require vaccines, even if you don't require masks, know that those OSHA guidelines are in place and they are going to look to see if you as an employer are providing a safe work environment for your employees. The guidelines have lots of steps that employers can take to do that. And then last but not least, just really assess kind of where you stand with your workforce right now. If you laid off employees or employees were working remotely, are there any obligations that you have to bring them back? If so, uh, do they perhaps need a new I-9, which is your, your immigration documentation, you know, if they've been out of the workforce for a while? And then, of course, we get a lot of calls on difficult employees and employee abuse. And so make sure that you have a good game plan for um, handling those employees. So I know that's a lot of information, but I want to be respectful of my other partners' time frames here. So I will turn it over now to John Carroll, who is going to talk to us about alcohol licensing. So John, I'll turn it over to you now. Perfect. Thanks, Melissa. Let me share my screen. And let's see. Perfect. Okay. So thanks, Melissa. My name is John Carroll, and I've got the coolest job in the world. Um, I work with Burr Foreman, and I get to help our hospitality industry clients with their alcohol problems. That's, that's really alcohol licensing problems, of course. And um, I was thrilled when Melissa asked me to, to pitch in today to discuss some of the um, alcohol beverage licensing issues that that we deal with on a regular basis. So a little bit about our firm. We've got offices throughout the Southeast um, and we're growing every day. So I wouldn't be surprised if next year we have a few more dots to add on that map. I wanna show you, if you look real close, you can see an office in Hilton Head and Bluffton and of course uh, Columbia as well. So um, we've got our bases covered in, in South Carolina and many locations in, uh, in Florida where Scott is. So, um, so regardless of where your, um, your concept is going to be located, uh, we can help out. So a couple of things that we like to do, we help restaurants 
um, pursue new business concepts. We help hotels um, pursue um, existing um, uh, license premises and expanding that license premises to include additional parts of the hotel. And we also um, assist other um, retail uh, restaurants in pursuing hybrid concepts like breweries. We also assist a lot of manufacturers, many uh, household name spirits that we um, that you you may even have in your cabinet at home, and and also some locally uh, grown uh, spirits, um, and um, uh, of course uh, Corky Klett, who you will hear from in a little bit, um, can assist our clients with intellectual property issues that relate to pursuing new. Um, alcohol beverage uh, manufacturing concepts. But but one of the things that we get the most questions about here locally for folks who are already in the the uh, hospitality industry. Who, so we've already started our, our restaurant, our hotel concept, and we've got our license in hand. And now we're trying to navigate all the regulatory red tape that goes along with having an alcohol beverage license and every day um, in our very competitive tourism market, we see and get questions about discounting beverages. I'm talking about happy hour. Everybody loves happy hour. Some of us may even want to be there now, so let's talk about it. Happy hour is a regulated thing in South Carolina. So, um, uh, and really discounting beverages in general um, when those beverages are being sold for the purpose of on-premises consumption um, can get a little tricky, uh, particularly um, in, in this market when every day we see restaurants and hotels getting more and more creative as to how to entice patrons visit um, their location um, within, uh, within usually the, the week uh, time span of a, of a typical traveler. So the general rule is this, all right? So let's go back to the basics. The general rule is this. No person who holds a license to sell alcoholic liquors, and, and I pulled this from the liquor statute, but the same rule applies to beer and wine. So no person who holds a license to sell alcoholic beverages for on-premises consumption may advertise, sell, or dispense these beverages for free at a price then less one half the price regularly charged or on a two or more for the price of one basis, all right? So that's a hard stop. You can't ever do any of those things. You can't ever give them give beverages away for free. You can't ever sell them for a price less than one half of the price regularly charged or for a uh, two for one or two for more basis. Now, you're, I'm sure some in our audience are already scratching their heads because you might think, wait, uh, my bartender gives away drinks all the time. We do it as a goodwill gesture in case an order um, gets messed up and we wanna make sure that we still get a good review from a client or, or whatever. You, you, you can see how there are already lots of loopholes and there are lots of intricacies to this rule, um, but the statute itself provides a couple of exceptions that will lay the framework as to how we can help our clients accomplish their uh, beverage discount goals. So the big exception is number one here. It's the happy hour exceptions, uh, exception. Some people call it the social hour exception. I'm a happy guy. I like to say happy hour. Alcoholic liquors may be sold at a price less than the price regularly charged, okay? Less than the price regularly charged from the window of time that is four o'clock p.m., until eight o'clock p.m., all right? So let's go back to the general rule. You are never, ever, ever allowed to discount beverages for a price less than one half the price. So you're never allowed to go be below 50% of the, of the menu price of a beverage um, and only within the uh, period of time that is 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. may you sell uh, an alcoholic beverage for a price that's less than the menu price, but still higher than 50%, right? So you can't ever go below 50% of the normal regularly charged price. And you have to ask, um, you can already see how some um, uh, thrifty 
uh, 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 folks in the hospitality industry try to play games with this. So what do you mean by regularly charged? Well, you will recall that when you submitted your application package for licensure to the South Carolina Department of Revenue, you eventually got a call from SLED. And SLED is required to do an on-premises safety inspection. And one of the items they asked you for was your menu, was your menu. And you're supposed to update the menu with SLED or DOR every time you go back for your two-year renewal. And the menu has food items and alcohol items, so they know the price regularly charged. And they also are looking to make sure the food that you're selling is, is actual real hot meals served in a climate controlled environment and not just peanuts and popcorn, because as you know, it's a requirement to sell, in order to sell liquor for on-premises consumption, you have to have a DHEC grade A, so you have to comply with all, all, those, um, all those serving requirements. Now, comping drinks, that can be okay on occasion, so long as you don't get out of control with comping the drinks. So the prohibition against dispensing beverages for free does not apply to dispensing to a customer on an individual basis to a fraternal organization that applies to sororities, rotary clubs, Zonta clubs, the chamber, um, and, uh, and through the course of its fundraising activities to a person attending a private function, et cetera. And there's a caveat to that that suggests, look, if you, if you start doing these um, uh, fraternal organization fundraisers every day and you're uh, comping beverages on the regular every day, then that starts to look like you're falling out of compliance with the spirit of that general rule saying that you cannot just give away free beverages. But, but here, are some of the, here are some of the interesting concepts that we have to help clients navigate every day. We've all been to restaurants where, say, after you buy a beverage or um, a food menu item, you might get a token. You can then redeem that token for um, say a dollar off a future drink. You've got to be careful with um, implementing policies like that because when SLED knocks on the door and sees that we're, um, that we're discounting drinks in exchange for non-monetary tokens, then you know, that, that could be considered a violation of our happy hour rules. Um, we've, we've all heard of Margarita Monday, right? So, uh, Margarita Monday, um, Tito's Tuesday, you name it. Um, it's hard to sell some of these drinks early on in the week when we're trying to get ramped up for the work week and not winding down. So, um, so we always see lots of um, our clients trying to get creative with selling uh, beverages to get um, boots in the door um, early on in the week. But you've got to be careful with the all day with the all day discount beverages um, because. You're, you're really supposed to stay within that 4 to 8 p.m. window. Now, we can help clients navigate that, but, you've, but that's the general rule. You've, you've got to keep that in mind. Same goes for game day pricing. So, so um, I'm probably in the minority here, but I am a Gamecock fan. I know Hannah Horn's a Gamecock fan, but um, you, know, you, might, you might run into a restaurant where, hey, beers are half off while the game is being played, while the Gamecocks are playing, or while the Tigers are playing, or as long as, long as football is going on, or whatever sport it is. Um, again, you've got to be very careful um, um, advertising discounts like that because, look, um, uh, particularly for the Gamecocks, um, who this year um, aren't exactly primetime, at least for their football team, um, they're going to be playing at noon, right? So. Um, so that discount um, uh, may run afoul of our happy hour beverage discount rules here in South Carolina. Um, beverages included in event entries. This is a big deal here in the low country where we have festivals and so many fun things to do on a regular basis. Um, but when, when you have an alcoholic beverage, one or more alcoholic beverage included in a ticket sale, then that is considered an alcoholic beverage um, that is being sold and is subject to these discount rules. So the question arises, well, is, is comping the beverage considered, um, considered you know, uh, 
something that would violate our happy hour rules. And the way we help our clients navigate that is, well, if this is a regularly recurring event that wouldn't fall under one of those exceptions that we talked about, then the menu item itself can be the ticket, the event entry, um, which includes, uh, say, you know, um, you know, listening to live music, one or two beverages, so forth. Um, and if that is a menu item itself, the ticket, and that is regularly that is regularly offered to the public and is on the menu, then the ticket item is not being discounted at all. So that's one strategy we use. But you better believe SLED is going to have a few questions about that. So it's good to have your ducks in a row before you try to implement a discount beverage concept like that. Another thing we run into is bundled sales. So food and beverage combined say, all right, if you buy a, a burger and fries, you get a free beer. Um, that We've seen a lot of success with that in a variety of markets. But um, again, you've got to be careful with that. Uh, uh, similarly to the event entry strategy, we try to we try to create a menu item that is a beer that includes burgers and fries all in one menu item, and that is the item that is being um, that is that is not being discounted at, at all. So when that runs up on your cash register, it needs to be one item. It's the it's the beer fry beer combo item, right? Um, same goes for non food items. So there is a uh, there's a restaurant that you know it's a chain restaurant that um, well I'll put it this way my wife nor my mother will allow me to go into this restaurant all right and they happen to sell a calendar a wall calendar all right it must be a special wall calendar because the calendar is forty five dollars forty five dollars to buy this wall calendar and uh, this restaurant will say hey if you buy this wall calendar we'll throw in a free beer. Um, and that can that can open itself up to a lot of uh, violations related to discount beverage rules in South Carolina. But there are ways to um, to make the case to SLED that this is all one menu item um, that is not being discounted at all, at all. So keep some of these things in mind. We're happy to help out if you want to get creative with your happy hour specials or your uh, beverage discount specials. There's an entirely different set of rules that apply to uh, discounting beverages for off-premises consumption, and, um, and I know we have some hotel operators who are um, who are tuning in. Think about your grab and go, where where you can um, you can buy a beer for on-premise, but you can also buy a beer um, for for you to take elsewhere. So um, so I know a lot in our audience have hybrid licenses. There's a different set of rules for discounting off-premises sales. So, um, so keep that in mind uh, before you give us a call. But, but, uh, but that's one thing that we get a lot of questions about. Um, another thing that we get some questions about, uh, particularly for um, restaurant tours and those in the hospitality industry that are initially applying for their first license for the location. Of course, this this uh, this set of slides could apply to your renewal license as well. But particularly when you're first applying for licensure, you want to make sure that you run criminal history checks before making any offers for hire. Now, I am not an employment law expert. If you have an employment law um, issue, the person to call is uh, Melissa Azalian Kenny, who, who you just uh, who, you, who you just listened to. But there are a few things that I'd like to talk about that relate to alcohol licensing. So one of the things that you are required to submit with your alcohol beverage license application is criminal history checks for any officer of the business, all right? And oh my goodness, South Carolina Department of Revenue has the broadest definition of officer that I've ever seen. It is anyone who, uh, well, of course, anyone with the title of officer in the, in the operating agreement, Anyone who owns a at least a 25% interest in the entity, anyone who not necessarily owns a dime in the entity, but um, has any type of managerial control over the entity, um, any store manager, so this is your boots on the ground store manager, um, and any non-store manager who has the ability to sign checks on behalf of the entity. Um, with the idea being they could potentially submit an order for beer and wine on behalf of the entity. So not necessarily a store manager, maybe um, a CFO 
or even just the in-house accountant, they would all need to be disclosed to uh, the South Carolina Department of Revenue. So particularly for the store manager example, um, the concern that we always have when back down checks are not run prior to hire is that, well, what if there was a, a, a criminal history issue that would trigger South Carolina Department of Revenue to decline the application due to the existing criminal history issue. And again, I know Melissa would, you know, will give you further guidance as to as to the proper way to, to run criminal history checks and stuff, because you, you never want to, you know, um, just uh, not give someone um, an opportunity because of some some uh, history issue. But I'm talking purely from an alcohol beverage licensing standpoint. What what could happen is if someone applies for the job, you offer the job, the employee quits the job, let's say from Texas, buys a home in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, work for your restaurant, and then all of a sudden we can't get an alcohol beverage license because of some criminal history issue that may not even be really a, a, a major deal. Um, so. Uh, if, if South Carolina Department of Rev Revenue discovers that issue, not only will they not allow that employee to be considered an officer or store operator or store manager, um, they will not give you the license if that employee is employed by the location at all, at all. So that faces the employer with a tough call. Do we continue pursuing our alcohol beverage license? Or do we have to have a tough conversation with the person that just sold their home and we offered a job to? Now, I'm not the employment law expert, but I suppose it's possible that if you find yourself in a pinch like that, that could expose your business to um, an action from the, um, from the would-be employee. Um, as you might expect, they've uh, already um, experienced some, some damages there. They've already sold their place. They've already quit their old job. Um, so that could be a pricey proposition. So the Department of Revenue has discretion to deny licensure for criminal history issues. And a lot of it comes down to a fact-based decision made by the Department of Revenue. So um, so there's not, what I'm trying to say is there's, there's not really a bright line line that we can draw on the sand and say, okay, these types of criminal history issues are fine, these aren't. A lot of times it comes down to the facts. So uh, some things that can trigger a denial are substance abuse problems. If there is time and time and time again, a criminal history of substance abuse, you know what, DOR may not want to give that store manager an alcohol beverage license. Um, the same thing with prior alcohol beverage license, uh, licensing violations. So one thing that we help our clients navigate from a licensing standpoint is um, what to do if a store clerk accidentally sells uh, product to a minor, whether it be for on-premises or off-premises consumption, um, how does that impact the status of the license? And we help uh, clients navigate that on a regular basis. But let's say if the uh, if the if the uh, would-be um, store manager has a history of ten times accidentally selling alcohol to minors then you know, the Department of Revenue is going to raise a red flag there. Another red flag they're gonna raise are crimes of moral turpitude, moral turpitude. So uh, moral turpitude sounds like a big fancy legal word that lawyers learn in law school, and that is correct. That's exactly what it is. But, but in a nutshell, if there's a crime whereby someone is lying in some way, say they committed fraud or stole money um, by running the books on a business, or um, you know, uh, also violent crimes could be a, a crime of moral turpitude, and those are always those types of crimes are always going to um, trigger a red flag with the Department of Revenue when determining whether to provide licensure. Because if this person has lied in the past, then what makes DOR confident that they're disclosing all the information that DOR is requesting in this application package? So that can trigger a red flag as well. Um, DOR has provided a little bit of guidance. Um, they, in a, in a prior alcohol um, beverage licensing administrative law court hearing, the court uh, room recorder recorded testimony from an agent of DOR saying that, well, DO, DUI offense is older than 10 years, 
we're, uh, we're not going to consider that as a reason to decline licensure. So we have that little bit of uh, policy that has now public information. We know that's not going to trigger um, a denial, but the best practice that we're asking uh, folks to do is if you run the criminal history check as you as you have to do, as you're required to do to apply for licensure, and you discover a criminal history issue, it is good to loop in the lawyers who deal with these moral turpitude crimes on a regular basis, look at the facts, look at the dates of conviction, and provide an assessment of risk to you as to, as to how likely it is the department is going to decline licensure, and that puts you in a better position to make a solid business decision as to whether to go through um, uh, with the hire from a licensing standpoint. And this is all too real. So um, public record, this is not a secret. This is publicly available for anyone to Google. PF Chains China Bistro Inc. against the South Carolina Department of Revenue. This is a 2016 case. PF Chains Greenville, South Carolina location. Um, experienced this exact scenario, this exact example that uh, we were just discussing, whereby they offer someone a job, um, store manager quits their prior job to join PF Chang's, and there were crimes of moral turpitude. Um, the person had been uh, found guilty of, um, of committing fraud, and it came down to a very fact specific argument whereby PF Chang's. Uh, was disclosing to the South Carolina Department of Revenue that yes, although these convictions exist, the story is that the employee um, was, had the opportunity to, to play college level sports, got injured, ended up uh, in a severe depression, ended up uh, committing substance abuse and crimes of moral turpitude. But after joining a rehab center is back on the mend and um, every step of the way since then has made sure that each location, each restaurant location he's worked for has been profitable and profit margins have increased ever since um, him working for those prior locations. And the administrative law court uh, thankfully agreed with PF Chains on that issue. So that's a happy ending to the story. Um, but there are a lot of cases where um, either the administrative law court won't agree with the uh, entity seeking licensure or the entity seeking licensure um, makes the decision to, to not move forward with the hire because um, obviously uh, in this example, PF Chains got their license, but it was a pricey proposition um, having to litigate that issue in the administrative law court. And, and Melissa, how are we doing on time? I've got another third segment here, but I wanna be respectful of others' times. Um, would you like me to, to continue going forward with some of the floor plan we, issues we see in the hospitality industry from a licensing standpoint, or, um, or would you like me to, to stop here? Yeah, John, I think we, we'll make our slides available to the other, uh, to the participants. So I think just for the sake of time, we should probably transition over to Corky, and I think he's up next. So yeah, thanks so much. Let's, let's transition to Corky, and we'll share our slides with the uh, participants. That sounds great. All right, thanks. Uh, over to you, Corky. All righty, thank you, John. I'm trying to get my slides shared. Hopefully that has come up for everybody. Um, Melissa, can you chime in to make sure that everything is on here? Yes, looks good, Corky. Okay, great, sorry about that. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Corky Klett. I'm an intellectual property attorney with Burr Foreman. Um, I am going to chat with you this morning about intellectual property in the hospitality industry. Um, it is likely that everyone on the call is familiar with the hospitality industry, but perhaps not so much with intellectual property. Um, so there are general categories of intellectual property. Um, these may start to look familiar to you, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and know-how. Um, patents really don't have a whole lot of applicability to this industry. 
those are for inventions, the protection of inventions. And I know most of you don't have R&D sections in your laboratories working away, trying to patent new products or methods, things like that. Trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and know-how, however, are very important to the hospitality industry. Uh, and we will go through each one of those categories, um, what they are, how they affect y'all, and what you need to do to be mindful of them and to protect them. Trademarks and branding. Um, in some ways, these are kind of sort of the same thing. Um, a trademark, as most of you may know, is any word, name, similar to design, or any combination thereof used in commerce to identify and distinguish the goods or services of one manufacturer or seller from those of another, and to indicate the source of those goods and services. So you need to think of a trade, everyone knows what a trademark is, but you need to think of it as a source identifier. Trademarks do not exist in a vacuum. You have to use them in commerce, and it is the connector to whatever it is that you're selling, and the minds of, of the public and, and, and the source of those goods or services. So in other words, your trademark standing alone is, is really meaningless unless you back it up with quality goods or services. And so every time someone sees your mark, you want them to say, ah, that is the source of something that I want to buy. And obviously some well-known trademarks are here as examples. Um, trademarks can um, be all sorts of different things. They can be logos, they can be designs, they can be words, um, they can be colors. For instance, one very famous um, protected color is the color pink for insulation. Um, most of you can go in your attic or, or underneath your crawl space and hopefully you will see pink insulation and you will know that the source of that insulation is Owens Corning. Sounds can be trademarks. Uh, not only does Harley Davidson have a shield registered trademark, which you see on the slide, but the sound of a Harley Davidson motor motorcycle is distinctive and is actually registered so that every time you hear that sound when you're outside at Biker Week, um, you will know that it comes from a Harley Davidson motorcycle. So trademarks are very important in the hospitality industry for all of the obvious reasons. Um, that is primarily the the prominent piece of intellectual property that most of you have and use and protect um, and are familiar with. Branding, however, is a little bit larger concept. It goes beyond just use of your trademark. It is more the touchy-feely commercial impression and perception that your brand provides to the consuming public. Uh, so, so not only is branding based upon trademarks, it's based upon quality of service. You know, everything all bundled together is your brand. Um, people are aware in, in the age of social media that, that, you know, branding is a big thing. What does branding mean? Branding is, you know, someone's trademark and persona and what they do and what they post and all those different things. So all of that together is branding. And obviously, you want to present a positive perception of your company and your business. And, you know, as, as you can see from the slide, um, you know, again, it's the perception of the consuming public. What is going on in the customer's mind? Um, what are you presenting to them that will make them want to buy your goods and services and become repeat customers? Um, you know, you want to build that loyal customer base. And how do you do that? Well, it's not just, a, you know, trademarks alone or, or other piece, bits and pieces of intellectual property. It's the brand as, as, as a whole, you know, in total. Um, so trademarks and branding is very important in the hospitality industry for all the obvious reasons. Trade dress is another aspect of intellectual property. It's a subset of, of the brand, but it really is more the look and feel of what you do, how you do it, where you sell your goods. Um, you know, when someone goes into your point of, of, of sale, whether it be, you know, a restaurant, a hotel, whatever it is, the trade dress are all of the bits and pieces and look and feel of, of you know, your trademark and, you know, the interior of your store and, and those sorts of things. 
um, that, that, that come all together so that customers know where they are, what they're buying, and, and the quality associated with those goods. I've got up here a picture of a Starbucks in China. Everyone here would walk into that Chinese Starbucks and, and know that you're in Starbucks because it looks and feels and, and you know has the same atmosphere as every single other Starbucks on the planet. You wouldn't know that you were in China rather than New York or Atlanta or LA. And all of that is trade dress, but also that dovetails with, with branding. Um, so, so trade dress is, is an important part of branding. Trade dress is a little different than a trademark, um, but, but it really, you know, the, the, the trade dress is the look and feel of whatever it is that, that is, you know, being, being dressed up. Um, it's not just the physical premises, it's your website as well. Um, is there a particular color scheme? You know, what is, is it whimsical in nature? What is it that sets aside your, um, website and distinguishes it from everybody else's. That is all considered trade dress. Trade secrets are another aspect of intellectual property, particularly uh, important to the hospitality industry. Trade secrets are information that has either actual or potential independent economic value by virtue of not being generally known. The value comes from it being kept secret. It has value to others who cannot legitimately obtain the information and is subject to reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. All three of these things are required for something to be a trade secret. Now for you guys, what types of trade secrets would the hospitality industry be involved with? Recipes, literally the secret sauce. Um, you know, we, we spoke just a minute ago about patents. Patents are something that are very powerful and, and, and are registered and issued by the government. It's a monopoly that gives you exclusive rights for a particular period of time. Uh, the bargain that is made with the government is you disclose whatever it is that you want to be patented. And in return, the government grants you a 20-year monopoly. Well, that's all fine and wonderful, but there's limits to patent protection. Most importantly, that 20 year term. What happens after 20 years? Well, whatever it is that you got patented, whatever the invention is, whatever the recipe, the formula, the methodology, it becomes public and is basically dedicated to the public domain once the patent expires. Trade secrets, however, don't have such a limitation. The only limitation that trade secrets have are for as long as you keep it secret. For instance, the KFC original recipe, the Coca-Cola formula. Those are very important trade secrets that are not patented because if they were, everyone would know what they were. And at the expiration of the patent after 20 years, anyone and everyone could start formulating Coca-Cola. Keeping it as a trade secret, however, means that the Coca-Cola formula from the 1800s is still intact and still proprietary and still in effect and Coca-Cola Corporation is the only ones that can blend Coke. Um, so trade secrets are very important. Uh, it's not just formulas and recipes, but there's other proprietary information that, that uh, y'all may have in the hospitality industry. Customer lists, vendor lists, um, your uh, pay scale, what you pay people. All of that has value because it's not known by your competitors. They can't get to that information and you keep it secret to maintain a competitive edge. Um, but again, the important thing about trade secrets are they're only protectable and they only last for as long as you keep them secret. Um, and, and that's why you've got the big, it's confidential, it's proprietary, you don't let anyone know because as soon as the cat's out of the bag, it's no longer a trade secret and it's no longer protectable. The next category uh, of, of intellectual property that I'd like to discuss this morning, and this is kind of a subset of trademarks, but Particularly you in the restaurant industry will be familiar with, hopefully, geographical indications. Now, you recall that I said that trademarks are most important in identifying the source or origin of goods or services. And that's for a particular, um, you know, whether, whether you provide hotel services, restaurant services, food items, that sort of thing, uh, you know, alcoholic beverages. Uh, everyone knows that uh, you know there are trademarks associated with 
those products. And, uh, you know, if you see a, a red triangle on, on a bottle of beer, uh, you know that it's Bass Ale, which, you know, the red triangle, in, incidentally, is the oldest registered trademark in England. Um, it, it's, you know, they've used it in commerce for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's still valid and, and protectable. Geographical indications, however, are a little different. Uh, they serve a similar purpose, um, but they are used on products that have a specific geographical origin and possess qualities or a reputation that are due to that origin. In order to function as a geographical indication, a sign must identify a product as originating in a different place, or a, specific, a given place. Champagne, Parma ham, Napa Valley wines, these are kind of sort of like trademarks, but, but they're from a particular geographic region, but they have the same purpose as a trademark in that they designate a source or origin of the product. And there are qualities associated with those particular products. In other words, yes, champagne is a sparkling wine. It's similar to cava from Spain or Prosecco from Italy but it's a particular type of sparkling wine. And when it is worthy of the champagne moniker label, uh, you know you know that you're getting something specific from a specific place. And with that comes all of the bundle of goodies uh, that, that, that they go with a geographical indicator. You know it's from France. You know that it's gonna have a particular quality. You know that it's a very highly regulated product, um, you know, and, and this is there's a lot of money at stake with respect to these geographical indications um, the, the folks that run the Champagne region in France are very persnickety um, about product quality, um, what the grapes are, where they're grown, are, are the, is it from an appropriate vineyard, are the processes to ferment those grapes. Uh, you know, it takes a specific amount of time. Um, there was a big scandal a couple of years ago in Italy related to the prosciutto Parma ham geographic indicator um, because some enterprising uh, Italians uh, in that industry uh, decided to try to inject, not literally, um, uh, some other strains of, 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 of pigs in, into the Parma line uh, to, to make the pigs bigger and more lean to um, be able to get, you know, basically more ham per pig. Um, but it violated the restrictions associated with Parma ham and that geographic indication. Uh, and, and so, you know, big scandal, worth a lot, a lot of money, um, but, you know, it, it, it undermined the value of that geographic indication because everyone who loves Parma ham weren't quite sure whether they were getting the real thing. Uh, so, you know, type of a trademark, almost a certification type mark that, uh, you know, says, hey, look, this is the real deal. This is a particular type of product from a particular region. Um, and all of the quality that's associated with that mark uh, should go with that product. Copyrights, another uh, branch of intellectual property. Um, usually associated with works of art, books, music recordings, things like that. A copyright vests with the author. Um, it gives the, uh, the author, uh, you know, a particular property right, which includes exclusive publication, distribution, and usage for the author. Um, like I said, books, poems, plays, songs, films, and artwork. You may ask yourself, well, gee, what in the world does that have to do with the hospitality industry? Well, there are lots of copyrights that you deal with every day that are yours, and you also likely deal with some that are not yours, which you need to be aware of. First, all of the content that you generate, whether it be your menus or your website and, and that sort of thing, is, is protectable copyrightable subject matter, and it's yours. Um, you don't want your competitor copying your menu and all the work that you've put into that with all of the descriptions of your wonderful dishes and things like that, because that would be copyright infringement. Um, you know, there are some, uh, you know, proprietary rights in that that are protectable. Um, when you put your menu, you know, you, you put the copyrighted content, you, you overlay it with your branding and your trade dress that we discussed earlier. 
you come up with a menu that has the look and feel and is distinctive uh, to your restaurant. Um, there are some copyrights that you need to be aware of that are not yours. And this comes uh, usually in the form of music. Those of you that have venues that play live music, play pre-recorded music or have ambient background music, um, musicians, record companies, the authors of that music and those rights have rights in that and you can't do that for free. Uh, in other words, you would be committing copyright infringement if you decide to uh, you know, pipe through some wireless music from your Spotify account into your restaurant or, or wherever, uh, you've got to pay for that. Uh, and that is usually handled through licensing with such entities as ASCAP and BMI. Um, if you are a venue that provides live music, you have a band or, or an individual that comes in to play music to entertain your, your patrons, uh, you need to make sure that that, that that music is licensed, whether it be the individual performer who has the license or you as a venue having the license that will cover that sort of performance. Um, because I can assure you that there are folks employed with ASCAP and BMI, the licensing agencies, uh, that, that come through and they have field agents that go out and they check and they go to your premises and, and your venues um, to check out whether you are playing music, uh, whether you're playing music that happens to be in their catalog, uh, and, and whether you are an appropriate licensee or not. And if you're not, you will get a nasty letter saying, we'll give you an opportunity or two to purchase a license. And, and if you purchase a license, we're all square and, and you do it right uh, from here on out. If you ignore those sorts of demand letters, uh, you'll, you'll find yourself in federal court uh, and subject to a copyright infringement lawsuit. Uh, so, again, very important to uh, make sure that you are squared away with music and, and that sort of thing. Um, before I leave this slide, I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware. One thing that we run into uh, fairly often is website content and, and who owns the rights to that? Well, obviously, usually the, the content is, is owned and, and the copyrights reside in the author of that content, which is usually you. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes you hire a website designer uh, to design and, and, and contribute to and then operate your website. That's usually a third party. I would caution everybody to make sure that you have agreements in place um, that everything that your website designer contributes or designs on your behalf or, or, or puts on your website is yours rather than theirs. In other words, it needs to anything that they do needs to be a work for hire with the rights going to you. And if you don't do that, and, and I've run into this situation a number of times, oftentimes the web designer decides at, at periodic intervals to increase the price of, of their website maintenance and design. And you say, well, then you know what? I, I really am not interested in paying that much. Maybe I might look elsewhere for a, a new web person. And, and your existing person says, well, that's fine, but we don't have a work for hire agreement in place. And so everything that's currently on your website belongs to me because I own the copyrights in it. And, and, and I didn't convey those to you. There's no agreement that says they are yours. So go ahead and, and get a new designer but you're gonna to have to start from scratch. You're not going to be able to export the entire content to, to another entity. So they've got you over a barrel. So I, I, would, I would caution that, that all of the appropriate agreements be in place to ensure that all of the intellectual property, and in this case, particularly copyrights, belong to you um, as the generator of the content, uh, even, even if you've got third parties doing it for you, to ensure that you own it rather than them. Employee issues, and, and, and this is uh, of, of concern because, you know, the, the hospitality industry um, at times can be a little transient, uh, particularly, you know, in the, in the kitchen or, or staffing, you know, waitresses, chefs, cooks, that sort of thing. But all of those people have access to your intellectual property, um, particularly on the trade secret side. Uh, you know, you, you bring in a new chef and you, you you teach them how to make uh, your signature dish. Um, you know, the, the, the accountant person that you hired knows which vendors you use, what prices that, that, that you pay for all of your, your goods and services, that sort of thing. 
Um, and, and in a transient environment, what do you do to protect your intellectual property if, if there's a high possibility that those folks may walk out the door um, and either just leave, join your competitor, start their own restaurant? Um, you know, you often have uh, chefs that say, you know what, uh, I'm tired of working uh, for this restaurant and, you know, part of my career path is opening up my own restaurant. It's, it's been one of my dreams. And, you know, sure enough, they do that. And, and a month later, you see some dishes and, and things that look uh, suspiciously similar to uh, what you've been serving and, and what they used to cook for you. Um, so, again, uh, not being an employment law expert, but like, like Melissa, but seeing these sorts of issues time and again, um, you know, that sort of thing, you know, in addition to being trade secrets is, is quite simply know-how. Uh, you're, you're hiring skilled folks who know how to do particular things, uh, and you want to be able to protect that know-how. You want to be able to protect your trade secrets. Uh, you don't want someone to be able to replicate your business model. Um, and, and so contracts are probably the easiest way to do that. Uh, contracts with non-compete provisions, contracts with confidentiality agreements, um, that sort of thing. So, you know, particularly with the key folks that have access to some of your more sensitive information, whether it be trade secret recipe type stuff, or, or even uh, just, you know, vendor lists, customer lists, you know, client type information. You want to lock that down so that it doesn't go walking out the door with on, on the last day of an employee's uh, work day. Uh, the last category is fairly general um, and, and occurs quite often in the hospitality industry, which is, you know, just kind of this general franchising and merchandising type concept. Um, franchising, as, as most of you know, is, is a method of distributing products or services involving a franchisor who, who is the, the entity that establishes a brand and a trademark and a trade name and, and business system. Um, oftentimes, there's quite a lot of trade dress that goes into a franchise. Um, everyone, not only are the golden arches, um, you know, fairly distinctive for McDonald's franchises, but, you know, the entire look and feel of a McDonald's restaurant or a Starbucks uh, coffee spot, um, you know, it, it's almost this kind of cookie cutter replication of all of those pieces of intellectual property uh, that goes into a franchise. And so a franchisee um, is, is basically invests in that system uh, and, and, you know, through contract is able to use the trademark, the business system, the trade dress, and recreate their own little business under the umbrella of the franchisor. Um, and, and that franchisee will then pay a royalty, probably some upfront costs, uh, and it gives them the right to do business uh, just like the franchisor. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not just necessarily a, a, a contract, but there's a lot of intellectual property that goes into that because it's really intellectual property that they are licensing from the franchisor. You know, what is it that, that makes a franchise? Well, it's the things that we just talked about, the trademark, the trade dress, the branding, you know, that replication of all of those things bundled together so that you don't know, you know, from franchisee to franchisee, um, there should be no difference in quality and, and, and you know, menu and all, all that sort of thing. Merchandising, uh, and, and this is kind of the last topic because I know I'm, I'm running short on time, um, is, is just kind of an aspect of branding. You know, you, you've got branded merchandise that is a collection of products that feature your logo, which you can sell. Um, you know, it, it's kind of dual edged in that it's a royalty or a, a, a revenue stream. Um, you know, you, you, you sell T-shirts and things like that, but it has your trademark and perhaps trade dress associated with your primary business. Um, down in Hilton Head, uh, a good example of this, uh, and they've done an extraordinary job, is the Salty Dog Cafe. Um, what started off as, you know, a, a watering hole uh, back in the day, and, and it was just a bar, uh, the merchandising aspect of, of the Salty Dog Cafe, uh, the revenue associated with that likely exceeds that generated by you know, the original restaurant and bar services. Um, so they have taken, uh, you know, the mark and all the trademark and all those great things and, and through merchandising um, have created an, an independent and, and likely more successful uh, business through, through T-shirt sales.
So that is a quick overview of intellectual property and how it relates to the hospitality industry. I know that uh, unfortunately it's like trying to drink out of a, a fire hose. There's quite a lot there. So if you have any questions, please contact me. Um, we are here to help and I will turn it back to uh, our next speaker. Corky, thank you very much. I think that's me uh, down here in Jacksonville. Um, and because I'm the quintessential Florida man, actually Katie is going to share my slides instead of me. Um, I, uh, as, as Melissa said when we started, I am a litigator in the Burr Foreman Jacksonville office. As a litigator, I argue for a living, um, which my family actually likes because since I argue all day, I don't have it in me to argue at night and I'm something of a pushover at home. But certainly my kids like that. Um, I'm here, although from Jacksonville, I'm here talking today. When, when Melissa gave me the opportunity, I, I left at it in part because um, I just finished my own term on the St. John's County um, Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. And St. John's County is the area here that encompasses really St. Augustine, Ponte Vedra Beach, an area that in terms of hospitality issues, um, certainly um, uh, uh, resorts, hotels, inns, uh, probably somewhat similar to Hilton Head. Um, but because my service on the, the chamber here, I appreciate the, the utility and, and, and of, of, of gatherings like this and hope I can add to that. And also I've had the pleasure in my career to represent both nationally branded uh, resorts uh, as well as kind of the locally owned uh, mom and pop uh, bed and breakfast. And kind of wanted to use that experience to talk to you today about what we'll generally call, Katie, if we want to move on to the, uh, give you an overview of what we want to talk about quickly. Um, which is we call it innkeeper liability but those of you by the way who are attending who aren't don't run an inn or a, or a hotel don't go anywhere uh, i think you'll see a lot of this really applies to almost any business that accepts patrons folks off the street for the purpose of doing business so what i'd, I'd like to do maybe is talk to you today about sort of what the overview is of liability here how that has grown into Sort of extended duties to others and then maybe most importantly given that we have this wholly novel uh coronavirus pandemic that we're hopefully looking to get back to full business and working on how that might affect that so uh moving forward um some of you may be thinking well what do you mean innkeeper uh, are you talking about just simply a bed and breakfast uh no no as you any of you who deal with lawyers too much probably know we tend to use words in a different sense or we use them in an archaic sense uh, we probably think it makes us sound smarter. It just means we're harder to communicate with. Um, but what I gave you here is the sort of black letter definition of innkeeper. One who keeps an inn or house for the lodging and entertainment of travelers. The keeper of a common inn for the lodging and entertainment of travelers and passengers. There are horses and attendants for reasonable compensation. I, I wanted you to see that. I don't know how many are still taking people by horses who have attendants, but that gives you an idea of how old the concept is in the law. Um, and almost equally old as recognizing sort of what an innkeeper is, is that an innkeeper has a general duty, and that is the duty to exercise reasonable care for the safety of their guests and patrons. Um, so a couple of things. As you can see, this definition of innkeeper means it covers everything from the nationally flagged brand, Omni, Marriott, Wyndham, Hilton, to um, a family-owned bed and breakfast to even probably the individual renter of a carriage house for vacation through a through an Airbnb. They all in essence have the same duty, which is this duty to exercise reasonable care. I'm going to talk about reasonableness in a minute because it, it's a concept that, that, that runs throughout all of this, but um, as I said earlier, I want to emphasize it's not unique. We're talking about this in the context of, of an innkeeper, but really any owner of a business that's open to the public, that has business guests, invitees come, has this general duty to exercise reasonable care, keep the property in a safe condition. Uh, that duty gives rise to what I would call the garden variety premises liability claims. Slip and falls, uh, obstructed walkways, elevator accidents, uh, poor maintenance of the facility, all claims that that, that that result from really a physical condition at the property or maybe the conduct of, of an actual employee at the property. Um, and they're all issues which want to emphasize this duty does not make the innkeeper or the business owner an insurer of the premises, insurer of the guest safety. All they're required to do is act with reasonable care. 
Well, that's a concept that explains why when you ask your lawyer, um, if I do X, will I be liable? The lawyer probably doesn't give you the yes or no question you're looking for. Um, they tell you it depends. And that's not just because the lawyer's being difficult or the lawyer doesn't want to go out on the limb, because generally in the context of litigation, what is or is not reasonable is what we call a jury question. Um, you may have a very strong idea of what's reasonable. The plaintiff probably has a strong idea. The judge might even have a strong idea. But ultimately, these six people who are off the street, who couldn't get out of jury duty and are going to hear your case, are going to be asked to decide what was or wasn't reasonable. And um, the reason the lawyer says, I don't know, is because the very best cases can be lost and the very worst cases can be won when you put it in the hands of someone else. Um, but it does bring up a very important issue here, which is beyond the legal issues, the liability issues, I think any really good advice lawyer can give you is don't take your insurance purchase lightly. Um, it's a very crucial um, part of your business. And the reason that is, is let's say that you're sued in a, a, probably the most common thing that we certainly in Florida we see nowadays is the slip and fall case. You know, 10, 15 years ago, it was kind of disfavored. People kind of recognize that if you're going to take on the responsibility of walking on two feet, you have a certain obligation to stay up on your own. Um, for some reason, there's been an explosion, at least down here in slip and fall cases. Um, so let's say you, you find yourself a defendant in one, and let's say you win it. You go to trial and you win it. Well, what went into that was exhausting. Uh, there was a pleading stage where you had filed papers where they framed the claim and, and, and you responded while you're not liable. That's followed by a whole discovery phase where your employees are being deposed. You're being deposed. There's document requests about how you conduct your business. Uh, there's probably an expert layer to this where the plaintiff's attorney has hired some expert in your industry who's going to offer their expert opinion as to why the things that you did and how you operated your business wasn't reasonable. You have to probably hire your own expert to counter that. It would be a whole medical layer of experts where the plaintiff's treating physicians talk about the scope of their injuries and why what may appear to you to, to be a fairly minor injury, in fact, has these debilitating effects. That's going to necessitate that your lawyer hire their own medical experts to do what's called compulsory medical exam, evaluate this, and give their own opinion. So by the time all that's done and a multi-day jury trial is put on and you've won, uh, there's probably been at least $100,000 spent in legal fees and defense. Uh, so that's why I say it's crucial. You need to talk to your insurance agent. You need to talk about what coverage is available. Talk about the details of your business and what you need and make sure you understand it because you don't want that $100,000 plus that you owe in a victory to be yours. You wanna make sure you've adequately protected yourself. And so again, I just encourage you, talk to your agent in detail about what your business is and what your business needs are. Um, but beyond what is this sort of, I call traditional or garden variety um, premises liability claims, what happens if the person's injured and it's not because of a physical condition at your property or, or your employees, but it's because of a third party. What if, say, somebody off the street or another guest assaults them, physically, intentionally punches them? Surely you can't be liable for that. Well, we'll turn the page. I think you'll see, yes, you, you, you can. You certainly can. Uh, the South Carolina Supreme Court has announced the rule, uh, and this is consistent across most states. In South Carolina, while an innkeeper is not the insurer of its guest, it is settled that an innkeeper is under a duty to guests to take reasonable action to protect their guest against unreasonable risk of physical harm. So even if what happens is an intentional knowing act by a third party, you may face liability for it. And the law applies that in a balancing test. You see this most often in negligent security cases where someone says, you should have known of this foreseeable risk that I would be assaulted because of the area you're located, because of the crime pattern, because of a history of, of prior um, um, incidents. And so therefore you should have applied or given me a higher level of security. And uh, that again becomes this balancing test is something for a jury. Uh, what was the risk of harm and what did you do in light of, uh, of, that, of that risk? Uh, and did you 
properly balance it out. No different than reasonableness, which is you, you don't want this going to a jury to, to, to leave that to. But um, this whole idea of protecting your guests from harm caused by others is particularly interesting because we have a fairly novel since what March or so of last year circumstance where we do have, I think, fair to say, some risk of physical harm visited upon your guests by others. And that would be if you may face liability because someone threw a punch at one of your guests or one of your, your, your customers. What if they threw a sneeze at them? What if they threw a virus at them? Uh, do you have liability for a guest or a customer who contracts COVID-19 at your property? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, it's, it's a new question. Obviously, we don't have a whole history of case law going back to say, oh, this is what you do. It's new. How do you determine what's reasonable in that context? Well, fortunately for South Carolina, um, South Carolina has taken steps to take some of that uncertainty out of it. Going forward, um, we'll see South Carolina, um, if we go to the next slide, um, both the House and Senate, in South Carolina have passed the South Carolina COVID-19 Liability Immunity Act. Um, it, as of yesterday, it had not yet been signed by the governor, but for all I know, it's been signed while we're doing this presentation. He's a supporter of it. He's been behind it. The expectation is it will be signed uh, this week. And it, the stated purpose of it is to offer businesses reasonable protections from the risk of lawsuits relating to the actual alleged or even feared exposure to COVID-19. The idea here being we're trying to get back to normal. You have enough on your plate deciding how best to operate and run your business without this added worry of, my goodness, what's going to be considered reasonable in dealing with COVID-19 and a public health crisis. Um, I want to make something very clear. Although it, the, the Act talks about immunity, it's not immunity from suit, like what we think of with sovereign immunity that you can't it goes from the idea you can't sue the king. Uh, typically, if government agencies, for example, undertake certain wrongdoings, you just can't sue them for it, no matter what. It doesn't matter how wrong or wrong it or, or right it is. They have absolute immunity from suit. They get sued, they raise the immunity, and the suit has to be dismissed. This really is immunity from liability. It creates a statutory defense, a statutory basis for you to set forth that what you did was reasonable, and therefore it shouldn't go to a jury it should be snuffed out early on by the judge. So what's the basis for that statutory defense? What the statute says is that you are presumptively reasonable if you adhere to public health guidance applicable at the time the conduct giving rise to the coronavirus claim occurs. So you have to adhere to public health guidance. If we move forward, um, we'll talk about how that works quickly. I know we're running low on time here, but a couple things. So in terms of applying this, who's covered? A covered entity is any for-profit or not-for-profit business entity organized in any form whatsoever. So again, while we're talking about innkeepers, this applies to any business entity. Um, it also applies to covered individuals. Who are those? Those are directors, officers, employees, representatives of the covered entity. I do think there's a, a potential hole in the law. I don't think it was intended, but um, it does raise a question, particularly if we're dealing with Airbnbs or, or, or smaller um, 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 potential rental opportunities, is what about a sole proprietor? What about a husband and wife who rent the carriage house or something like that? Uh, is that a business entity? Um, I think probably if it's engaged as a business, that was what the legislature, I would assume, was intended. But if I was the plaintiff's lawyer and I was bringing the suit, I would certainly argue that a sole proprietorship uh, is not covered by this. That that probably goes back to your planning issues with insurance. If you're going to operate a small business like that. You, you should talk to your lawyer about business organization and what's the best way to do this to avoid liability. If I was, I would think if someone were renting out a Airbnb, a small piece on their property, they would want to make sure that a claim didn't expose them to a loss beyond the the, the business entity that held that. So the coverage is very broad. Um, what is covered? If we go forward, we'll see that also was very broadly defined. It's a coronavirus claim. They don't have to have it. It deals with the actual alleged or feared exposure to getting the virus from really 
any operation that takes place, not just on the premises, but in connection with the premises. So if you're providing shuttle service to uh, restaurants or to the beach or something of that nature, and someone can somehow magically trace their contraction to the shuttle, that's covered too. So this is very broad coverage of who's covered, very broad coverage as to what is covered. But going forward, to wrap this up, particularly down here in Florida, um, an interesting question for us would be, what does it mean that you have to follow, adhere to public health guidance? Uh, here in Florida, uh, since at least September of last year, there's been a very large distinction between what the federal government through the CDC has recommended and what we're doing in Florida. So what happens, what does public health guidance mean? Here again, the legislature has been very friendly, very helpful. They've defined it for you and they've let you know it's the state. Good, good federalism here. They're telling you it's published guidance, directive, order, or rule provided by South Carolina, by the South Carolina OSHA, South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. Federal guidance only matters if it's referenced by those state entities. So when you're looking at how do I adhere, what's public health guidance? Um, the federal government CDC is telling me I still have to wear a mask if vaccinated outdoors. The state doesn't say that. The state is going to be the touchstone for for your for your assertion of immunity here. Um, going forward, though, what's not covered? What's not covered um, are if they can show that a business and innkeeper was grossly negligent, reckless, willful, intentional misconduct, or a failure to make any attempt to adhere to public health guidance. I think this is important here. What, what this law really does, it, you are not going to be the insurer or, or a regulatory agent of the state. It's not your obligation to gain immunity that you faithfully, in every instance, implement every single detail of state guidance. Remember, the touchstone here still is reasonableness. You have to reasonably adhere. And I think this exclusion here that says if you fail to make any attempt to adhere to public health guidance shows what the exposure is. This, this shows really not unlike going back to slip and fall cases. An important thing for you in defense of these matters is making sure you have a standardized process in place, just as I'm sure you tell your employees or you, you have planned sweeps of your premises to make sure that, that there's no debris on the floor that spills are identified quickly and, and cleaned up. You probably should make an effort to have someone in your business whose responsibility it is to track updates from your state, what requirements are on a regular basis, so that when someone sues you and says such and such mask provision wasn't wasn't man, wasn't complied with, and that's going to be the case. You, it's a very difficult thing when you're running the business. How how hard do you push your customers to comply with things? If you can show that you had a process in place where you made the um, affirmative effort to identify these standards and apply them, that's going to make it much more likely that a court's going to be able to say for you, you get the benefit of the South Carolina Liability Immunity Act. Um, and last thing on, on, on this particular topic, what else is not covered? You'll see it's of limited duration. One good thing, it's retroactive. It dates back to March 13, 2020, which I believe was probably the date South Carolina first declared a public health emergency. It's going to extend through at least June 30 of this year for claims that arise during that period, or could be later, 180 days after the final state of emergency is lifted. Um, so this is not something, hopefully, hopefully this is all going to be moot. We're all going to be vaccinated or have a, an immunity that, that this will be in our rearview mirror. But for this prime period of uncertainty, or trying to restore your business and get back to, to full uh, operating ability with the least amount of concern, the least amount of ambiguity and unknown, um, the state is adopting for you this, I think, hopefully very um, reassuring uh, act to let you do that. Um, but again, it, does, it doesn't alleviate obligations here. And it, 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 it means that you really need to make it a point to have a point person um, that if this happens, if you get such a claim that you have in place an established procedure, you can show a court that when they ask, when they send you discovery that says, please provide your procedure for identifying and implementing the um, public health guidance, that you can affirmatively answer that. This is what we did. 
And uh, that is something that hopefully will allow you to get back forward, going forward. Let us go back to concern about those um, general garden variety claims, which unfortunately in this day and age are unaffordable. I mean, unavoidable. There's there's a there's a lot of folks out there um, looking for those. So um, I end this again with the things you can do so you don't need me. And that's when a guy who makes his living doing it says you don't want me. Um, make sure your insurance coverage is what it is. Make sure you have in practice things that are that are that are proactive to, to, to make sure not only these things don't happen, but that you uh, you have a good valid defense when when you do find yourself unfortunately in that circumstance. Again, I appreciate this great opportunity to talk to you all. I, I'm hoping this is the groundwork for me to get a personal visit to Hilton Head soon. But uh, thank you very much for your time and, and thanks for letting me participate. I really appreciate it. So I, I think probably back to you, Melissa. Yes, thanks, Scott. That was great information. I enjoyed hearing your comments on that South Carolina COVID Immunity Liability Act. I mean, what timely information. It sounds like the governor's going to sign that any day. So thank you for reviewing that. And thank you to Corky and John as well. That was great information. So I appreciate you all uh, participating. And thank you to our attendees. We hope that this information is valuable. And if you have any questions, Certainly feel free to reach out to any of us via email or phone. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Our next event will be on July 29th. We'll be covering intellectual properties in more detail. So if you have an interest in that, please feel free to you join us again. And with that, I will wrap us up for the day. Thanks so much and have a great day.